I'm Anon Butler. I'm the Executive Director of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and I'm pleased to welcome you to CJCC's fall public meeting focused on understanding the, the district's sentencing guidelines for violent crimes. Um, we are going to have a robust and a thoughtful evening. Uh, I'm pleased that we have Barb Toom Suve, who is the Director of the DC Sentencing Commission, who will provide an overview of our sentencing guidelines for violent crime, and then we're gonna have a panel. We have the illustrious panelists here, um, and they will be introduced when we shift to the panel. I also want to acknowledge um, at least uh, the, the CJCC members that are here. If you could please stand. All right, let's give them a few more Chair, uh, the chair of the, the U.S. Parole Commission, Patricia Smoot. We have the director of pretrial services, Leslie Cooper, who is also the CJCC co-chair. We have our new U.S. attorney, uh, Jesse Liu. We have our the, the, the chief judge, I'm studying the chief judge of our D.C. Superior Court, Robert Warren. And we have our deputy mayor, uh, Kevin Donahue, who's here. Just a few administrative details before we uh, dive right into the program. Um, restrooms are straight out of the door beyond the security offices, and it'll be on your right. Um, you have received, has everyone received a clicker? Everybody received a clicker? Okay. Um, we want to make sure that you return those clickers to us <laughs> at the end of, um, at the conclusion of our evening. And um, we have uh, today's, this evening's MC will be CJCC's Deputy Executive Director, Christy Love. And so she will be facilitating, or at least making sure that we're shifting from um, throughout the program, and then she will open up the floor at the end of the evening for questions and answers. Without further ado, I am pleased to bring first to the podium Kevin Donahue, uh, Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, and also the CJCC co-chair. He will be followed by Leslie Cooper, our other CJCC co-chair, and then Christy Love will take it from there. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, on behalf of the mayor, I want to welcome you. Um, I look forward to attending um, and being able to listen to the dialogue that happens at the CJCC uh, public meetings. Um, uh, we try to be very careful and thoughtful to think of ideas and topics that, uh, in which um, there would be a real benefit to shining a light on. Um, uh, I just, about an hour and a half ago, spent um, uh, almost two hours with the Chief of Police and Councilmember Trey on White uh, in a long discussion about uh, crime, particularly violent crime in Ward 8. Um, and uh, the question comes up around, uh, at some point, around sentencing for violent crimes. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and there was a, a discussion that, that, to me, highlighted um, the value and need for just transparency about what they are. Um, uh, and I think it's an area where there is a lot of misunderstanding and misperception. Um, uh, and so I think an evening like this is going to benefit everyone. Um, lifting up a little bit, I, when I, um, a lot of what I do as deputy mayor is recommend to the mayor policies around uh, what we should spend money on, laws we should change, or what we should do operationally. Uh, and a theme in public safety uh, and justice uh, is around trying to have a fairer society and a fairer city. Um, uh, I believe and the mayor firmly believes that if we have a fairer city, we'll have a safer city. Uh, now the context of that around um, sentencing is that um, as a country, we're trying to um, take the many steps needed to reverse um, uh, what was policies that covered a wide range of government functions and criminal justice functions that led to mass incarceration. Uh, mass incarceration that disproportionately uh, impacted individuals along racial and economic lines. Um, and when, we when I think of, I try to break down the theme of mass incarceration into manageable, actionable pieces, I think we're sending too many people um, to prison for too long. Um, uh, and that once they return, there's a long tail of the impact of that incarceration uh, that outlasts, far sometimes outlasts uh, their time in, in, uh, in which they are incarcerated. Uh, and there's a lot of different things that as a city uh, we have the power to do. Um, and each one is, I think, an incremental step towards a fair city, whether it's 
decriminalizing um, marijuana, um, uh, where NPD last year made all of 10 arrests for marijuana possession. Um, now we have public uh, consumption, which is more of an educational issue, um, but that's down from literally hundreds of arrests for marijuana possession. Um, uh, to things like trying to take a look at what it means um, for when someone should have their record sealed, uh, making the process, particularly for those who are not convicted of a crime, um, easier, faster, more automatic, not necessitating finding a lawyer to help them do it. And for those who are convicted, um, uh, trying to have a clear path if an individual in particular stays out, is not rearrested, uh, that they have a chance to be able to um, have their time spent, not last years beyond their time spent in prison. Um, and I think the key to being able to take these steps is greater understanding and clarity. Um, I think the extent to which we can really make people understand um, uh, the system that we have, um, what works about it, and I think a lot of things in this city, we are in many ways a model for how things should work. Um, uh, and, I think, um, and I think around sentencing reform uh, and sentencing guidelines um, is an area where there is, um, uh, I think, benefits from opportunities like this to shine a light on it. I think we do a lot of things thoughtfully. We do a lot of things very well in the city. Uh, and I think to the extent to which we can help the residents understand um, how we've evolved as a city when it comes to sentencing, um, I think will benefit all of us. So thank you very much for being here. I talked for about three times as long as I wanted to. And I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Leslie Cooper. Good evening, and thank you, Deputy Mayor Donahue. Once again, welcome to everyone um, who is here with us. We are delighted to see so many of you here for this very important conversation around sentencing for violent crimes in the District of Columbia. As you've heard from Executive uh, Director Butler, we do have a panel that comprises the entire spectrum of the justice system, both at the local and the federal level, and so we look forward to a very productive and engaging conversation with you this evening. This topic is one that is of importance to all of us, whether it is through our own personal experiences with the justice system or those that may have been experienced through a friend or a loved one who has traveled this particular path. It also may be of importance to us just by virtue of our professions as members of the collective criminal justice community. So whatever it is that prompts your interest in this discussion, we invite your input and your feedback as we have our conversation this evening. So again, thank you for taking time out to engage in our discussion, and we look forward to our conversation. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Manon or Director Butler mentioned, my name is Christy Love, and I am the Deputy Executive Director for CJCC, and I'm excited to be here. This is actually my first CJCC public meeting in my role as Deputy. Um, so we're going to start out in, um, with engaging you just a bit. And um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, but we just want to gauge your current understanding of the district's sentencing guidelines. So I'm going to ask Khalil Munir to come forward. He is a policy analyst at CJCC, and he is actually the one who planned this particular event. So thank you, Khalil, for doing that. And he's going to guide us through a bit of a quiz. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. So what we have this evening is our options finder process and this is an interactive process whereby each of you should have a clicker in your hands and so what's going to happen is that a question is going to come up and you'll see a number of different responses please click on the response that is most appropriate and then after a short period of time for reflection I'll move to um, the next question that will show the responses so please remember, once this is over, don't take the clickers, otherwise I'll, my pay will be docked. And uh, hopefully, what, and, and essentially what this process involves is we'll be asking questions that directly relate to the presentation by um, Ms. Barb Toombs. And so whatever questions you have and answers you require will be provided in her presentation. So without further ado, let's go to our first question. First question, where do you live? So identify the ward or the state.
Well, the numbers speak for themselves. 25% of you are from Maryland and 13% from Virginia. Uh, Ward 2 is lagging behind. And Ward 6 has 19%, Ward 5, 13, Ward 4, 13, and Ward 7, 3, and Ward 8, 3 as well. What is your age group? 18 and under, 19 to 30, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, and Medicare eligible and older? Number five. <laughs> Well, we have some seasoned professionals here. Uh, overwhelming response of 39%, 51 and older, 30% for 41 to 50, and the other numbers respectively. Now we get to the meat and potatoes. So, which of the following best describes your familiarity with the district's sentencing guidelines? One, unfamiliar. Two, somewhat familiar. Three, very familiar. Four, I did not know the sentencing guidelines existed. Sixteen percent said unfamiliar. Fifty-nine percent said somewhat familiar. Our experts in the house said twenty-two percent, very familiar. I did not know, 3%. When are the sentencing guidelines applied? One, at arrest. Two, at the time of charging prosecution. Three, after a determination of guilt. Four, all of the above. And five, no clue. Zero percent said at arrest. Nine percent said at the time of charging during the prosecution. Three, 69 percent said after a determination of guilt. Thirteen percent said all of the above. And nine percent said no clue. Who is responsible for applying sentencing guidelines? One, public defenders. Two, prosecutors. Three, judges. Four, I'm not sure. Well, 94% said three judges. Hmm, 3% said four, I'm not sure. 2% said, I'm not sure which one that is. Process. Process. Thank you. Do judges have discretion in applying the sentencing guidelines? One yes, two no, three unsure. Excuse me, yes, 84%, 13% said unsure, 3% said no. Approximately what percentage of the time do judges adhere to the sentencing guidelines? One, 53%, two, 21%, three, 97%, four, 74%. Fourteen percent said <clears throat> fifty-three percent. Ten percent said twenty-one percent. Forty-one percent said ninety-seven percent of the time. 
and 34%, 74% of the time. Which of the following is true? Past criminal history is factored into sentencing decisions. Two, plea bargaining can affect the type and length of a sentence, even when the guidelines apply. Three, judges can depart from or disregard the sentencing guidelines. Four, all of the above. Please be advised that none of these are trick questions. <coughs> well, the answers will <coughs> indicate that. 3% for number one, 0% for number two, 3% for number three, and all of the above, 94%. <coughs> In 2016, the violent crime sentenced most frequently in the district was one, assault with a dangerous weapon, two, robbery, three, kidnapping, four, aggravated assault, five, carjacking while armed. Fifty-three percent indicated number two, robbery. Twenty-four percent indicated one, assault with a dangerous weapon. Four percent. Twenty-one percent said four, aggravated assault. Three percent said three, kidnapping. Thank you, and please return your option finder remote to a staff member. Now, all of your questions about these guidelines, they'll be answered when Ms. Toombs comes up. So we're waiting with bated breath to hear her presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Khalil, and we will not keep you waiting much longer because I would like to invite uh, Barb Toombs Suve, who is the executive director for the district's sentencing commission. <coughs> Push it down so it's a little bit bigger than I am. <laughs> Well, thank you for taking the time to come to the meeting tonight and to learn about the sentencing guidelines. The sentencing guidelines are, you know, across the United States um, and the federal government. I have a variety of states that have them, but every state's a little bit different and the district's a little bit different also. So I'm hoping this educational time will give you uh, some background on how our guidelines operate and what is the premise behind their construction. So. So I'm going to talk tonight about what the Commission does, our voluntary sentencing guidelines, some overall sentencing trends in the district, uh, some different sentencing scenarios, and then I'll have time for questions and comments if you would have. About the Commission. So the Commission is a organization that uh, was developed, was put together to, um, excuse me, I have to get organized. Um, to develop sentencing guidelines. And the guidelines were developed and implemented uh, to promote certainty, consistency, and adequacy of punishment. Those are our three uh, statutory goals and what we try to make sure accomplishes with every sentence that's sentenced under the guidelines. Uh, the guidelines are determinate sentencing structure, meaning that the sentence imposed is a single number. Uh, previously, uh, the district did have an indeterminate sentencing system prior to the uh, guidelines where you would have a range, so you could have a sentence from 5 to 15. And the individual at the time of sentencing never knew whether they were going to serve the 5 years or they were going to serve the 15 years. So under the guidelines, it's a determinate sentence. They know when they walk out of the courtroom what they're going to serve. Um, also, the whole purpose is to make sure that similar uh, offenses committed by similar offenders receive similar sentences. And I use the word similar. 
uh, there's not going to be a perfect match to match because every offender and every set of circumstances around offense is a little bit different. So we want to have them similar. They don't have to be identical. Okay, uh, the agency also is responsible for reviewing and analyzing sentencing data. And we do a lot of this in, in uh, looking at trends, looking at how uh, criminal histories change, and also the types of offenses that are being committed in the district. Uh, the agency actually has a large data system that allows us to do analysis, and uh, we provide that information to commission members and to the council and the mayor's office. And also, uh, we calculate judicial compliance with the guidelines. And compliance, I'll go into a little bit later in more detail, but compliance means how often does the court impose the recommended sentence uh, guidelines. And by, by the recommended sentence, I mean both the type and length of sentence imposed. And it's something that we calculate on every felony count that's required to be uh, uh, compliance actually uh, calculated. And also we increase public awareness, which is what we're doing now. And we do our, we have a very a robust training uh, agenda that we go around to agencies and help them understand the guidelines so that they're properly uh, implemented. Okay. So the agency is an independent government agency, so we're not under the mayor, we're not under the council, we're independent. Uh, we have 17 members that represent all the major criminal justice agencies in the uh, district from the court to prosecutors, defense attorneys, researchers, uh, public members, uh, prison parole. So it's this group of people who actually sit down and have very robust discussions about what types of sentences are appropriate and when we may need to modify the guidelines. Uh, we have 12 voting members and uh, five non-voting members. And we have six staff. And the staff basically focuses on two things. One is helping um, practitioners and professionals implement the guidelines and also researching and um, analyzing data. So now we're going to talk about the guidelines. Okay. okay. The guidelines apply, and this is very important. This here. Uh, the guidelines apply to pleas and verdicts after June 14, 2004. So they do not apply to misdemeanor offenses, they do not apply to traffic offenses, and they do not apply to offenses that may have occurred before this date. Um, they apply to felony convictions only. They do not apply to juveniles when they're trialed as a juvenile. They do not apply um, to um, any crimes other than the adult felonies. And they're completely voluntary. What I mean completely voluntary is the court is not, uh, is not forced to apply the guidelines. They are not presumptive guidelines. As long as the court imposes a legal sentence, they can impose any sentence they want. We do have very high compliance, but it, it's not a voluntary, um, it's a <coughs> voluntary compliance and not a forced one through presumptive. And basically, you look at these grids here, I know it looks kind of, kind of complicated, but it really it's quite simple. I'm maybe I'm overstating it. It's, uh, it's simple. <laughs> There's two things you look at. <laughs> uh, one is the severity of the current offense, so how severe is the offense for which the person is being sentenced? The second is the criminal history of the offender. How many previous times has that offender been convicted of a variety of crimes that would build their criminal history? So those are the two primary factors we look at. Okay. So we have a grid. I'm, you know, my background's in stats, so I love numbers and grids and those types of things, and you'll learn to love them also. <laughs> so the grid has, is we have two grids, one for felony uh, drug sentences and one for non-felony drug sentences. We call the non-felony drug sentences our master grid. So no, every... No, they're not non-felony drug sentences, they're non-drug sentences. Uh, yeah, non-drug felony, excuse me. Um, so, Look at the vertical axis, axis on the left-hand side, and that lists all of the offenses, and they're ranked into different severity groups, from one to nine, with one being the most serious offenses and nine being the least serious offenses. So on one, you would see something like murder, a first-degree murder, first-degree murder while armed. On level nine, you would see things such as fraud, 
or um, receiving stolen property. So the severity of the offense moves up that uh, grid, and that's how they're ranked. Across the top of the grid, you see a horizontal axis that has criminal history scores. And the criminal history scores, again, go from A to E, with A being no criminal history or a very limited criminal history, over to E, which has like six plus points. So these are people who have long criminal histories. And so that's, uh, that's it up. You see the colors. Uh, the colors are yellow, green, and white. White is, is a presumptive prison sentence. And it should be noted that presumptive prison is allowed in every cell on the grid. The yellow boxes are probation, in which the court can impose a probation sentence, or a short split sentence, or a prison sentence. So there's three options. They have the most options. When I say short split, what I mean is the court will impose a sentence that is within the range recommended by the guideline. It will um, suspend all but six months and then put the person up to six months and then put the person on probation afterwards. So it's a split. They do some time incarceration and then some time uh, under probation afterwards. So you see, see the uh, three different levels there. Um, again, probation, short split, and prison. But remember, prison is an option in every cell. Okay, uh, prison, within the numbers within the grid, I know it's hard to see here, you'll see a range of numbers like 36 to 64. That is the recommended length of sentence for that cell for that offense in that criminal history category. So the court may choose any number within that range and is considered a recommended sentence or guideline recommended sentence. On the drug grid, we have, it's a much smaller grid. It only has uh, four levels, but it's basically set up the same as the non-drug grid, with one being the most serious, those are our armed drug offenses, four being our attempts, uh, you see attempted um, quid, attempted uh, distribution, and so forth. And again, the same type of structure with the offenses on the left-hand vertical axis, criminal history on the top horizontal axis, same number of criminal history categories, and the same sentencing options. You should know <coughs> if you're uh, a member, we have much, uh, many more probation and uh, short split sentences on the drug grid than we do on the non-drug grid. Again, I guess one of the things with sentencing uh, and with the probation and the short splits where they're placed on the grids is we look at those as lower level offenses in which rehabilitation is an option for that offender where with the prison only, it's more of a public safety, the crimes are much more serious, or the criminal history is much more serious. So the guidelines are trying to balance that rehabilitation with public safety, and we do that with the different sentencing options that are available uh, through the system. Okay. So, you're gonna find an offense, uh, your sentence. First thing you're gonna do is look at the offense severity group, like I said, which is on the vertical left-hand axis. Every crime, every felony crime is assigned a uh, offense severity group. Uh, what you see here on the grid are the most common ones that we deal with on a daily, on a regular basis, but every, every offense is ranked in one of those nine categories. You find the criminal history category, which is across the top. Oops. Oops. Not so yet. Across the top. Um, when you look at criminal history, the number you see there is a, is a calculation, and not a simple calculation. Uh, I'm sure our friends from CISO so will address that later. But uh, it's a calculation where we look at a number of things, all prior felony criminal history, I mean, all prior felony convictions, juvenile adjudications, misdemeanors, although the guidelines do not apply to misdemeanors, misdemeanors are counted in criminal history. If you have a conviction from another jurisdiction, say Maryland or Virginia, those are counted in it. And also we look at the time between your previous crimes and your current offense. So using this formula we have, it comes up with a point system. So when you see six points or seven points, it doesn't mean they have seven felony convictions. It means that there's some calculation that all these things combined come up with a criminal history score. Okay. So, 
Here we're going to look at the grid, and we see that we have uh, the offense of aggravated assault. And it's there on the red. I don't know how to get the little light here, so you just have to bear with me. So the red here is a level six. Excuse me. Uh, it's level six <laughs> on the vertical axis, and you can see that it has one of the shaded cells, which would be a short split cell, and the rest are presumptive. Probation. This individual has a criminal history of 2.5. So you go up to category C, and where those two axes meet, it gives you the recommended sentence. Okay, so you can cross here, you can down here, and this is your recommended sentence. So the recommended sentence under this, for this offense would be a presumptive prison sentence between 30 and 72 months. So simple. Down, cross, there you go. Okay, so. So I talked earlier about guideline compliance. And that's something that we looked at very carefully in uh, the agency. And we, you know, how often does the court impose what is considered a guideline compliance sentence? That means they impose the correct type of sentence, whether it be probation, short split, or prison and they imposed the proper length, so it was within the <coughs> recommended box there. Um, we do allow for atypical cases. Whenever the guidelines were put together, they were put together to address the typical burglary or the typ typical robbery, but there are always going to be cases where s the situation is different. You know, it may be the circumstances surrounding the burglary, the, the uh, type of robbery, the amount of harm that was done, so forth. So the <coughs> judges need discretion to look at those cases and make adjustments to them. We call these departures. They can depart from the guidelines by using one of the de uh, preset departure factors. And you'll see here we have aggravating and mitigating. Aggravating allows for a more serious uh, sentence. And there's 11 preset aggravating factors. And they include things like um, deliberate cruelty to the victim, or the victim was particularly vulnerable because of their age, or the crime committed involved a high degree of planning. Those are situations that would take a typical crime and make it more serious, allowing for a more, uh, a more serious sentence. On the other hand, being fair, we have the mitigating factors, which allow for a uh, low, uh, less severe sentence whenever certain factors are uh, present, such as, you know, um, they participate in the crime due to coercion or threat, or the defendant lacked the capacity to understand the seriousness of his actions. So those are circumstances where, you know, yes, the crime was committed, but the circumstances around which it was committed, the court takes into consideration and makes that sentence to be fair and, you know, consistent. Um, like I said, we, we monitor this on every felony count that's sentenced, and typically uh, last year our compliance rate was 96.7%. Compliance rates have been since 2010 in the 90s, uh, in the uh, mid, uh, low to mid 90s. So it's very consistent across uh, time and across different judges. So now we're going to uh, look at sentencing trends. What goes on in the District of Columbia? Okay. Okay. So this is a chart here looking at sentencing trends by cases, counts, and offenders from 2010 until 2016. That's once in, that's something I want you to keep in mind that um, the data is provided for the year the sentence was imposed, no matter when the crime was committed. You know, with some more uh, serious crimes, it may take two or three years to be sentenced. So this does this will never match arrest crimes because somebody gets arrested, but they may, may not be sentenced for two or three years. But this is a crime for sentence. You are always going to have more counts than you do cases, because one case can have several counts. For example, if you had a robbery, you could have a, an armed robbery, you could have an aggravated assault, you could have a carjacking, you could have all of those. So those would each be individual counts in that case. And you always have uh, offenders who have more than one case in a year. So you have cases, counts, and offenders, okay? The one thing also, which is very important, is they are sentenced for the crime of conviction, not for what they were arrested for, 
not for what they were prosecuted for or indicted for, it's what they were sentenced for. And if you look at uh, how the system works through, you will often see that what they're arrested for is not what they're uh, sentenced for. But the guidelines apply and doesn't take into consideration what happens before the actual guilt verdict comes down on that offense. Okay? And sentencing can always take, like I said, 6 to 24 months after a crime, depending on how serious it is. So sentencing trends are always going to be behind arrest trends. But I think when you look at some of the historic data we're going to show you here later, you'll see sentencing trends when they hit peaks for certain crimes. And I'm sure the police department can talk about, you know, this was probably a year or so before when they had the uh, hit an arrest for those crimes. It just takes that way long to work through the system. Okay? Also, if you look at this here, you can see from about 2012, we start seeing this decline. I mean, it's not straight decline, but it's going down. You see it across all of them. This is primarily due to drug offenses. We saw a significant decrease in drug offenses from 2012 to 2016. So the overall reduction in crime is prim primarily uh, attributed to the drug offenses. Drug offenses went down, excuse me, from 1,538 counts of drug offenses in 2010 to 312 in 2015. So that was about a 79.5% decrease. Now we're seeing a little bit of an uptick, if you see here in 2016, from 15 to 16. That's primarily due to the opioids and some of the uh, excuse me, synthetic marijuana. Whether that's just a blip or whether that continues, we'll have to look at the 2017 data, but we saw that decrease down to about 2015, and then a little bit of an uptick in 2016, but it's too soon right now to know whether that's something that is going to continue or not. Okay. So how are cases disposed of? <coughs> Primarily and overwhelmingly, they're disposed of through pleas. Pleas range in the 90% every year, uh, followed by jury trials, and the least common way of disposition is a bench trial. And a bench trial means that the, the case is heard before a single judge or bench judge. So they don't have a jury, they don't have a plea, it's, it's judges that make the de decision. So uh, again, it's uh, predominantly way high on, on the pleas on there. Okay, the next is what about the types of sentences do we have in the district? Who's getting sentenced? The commission dropped, um, has put uh, offenses into categories. We have, excuse me, we have murder, sex, violent, weapons, property, <coughs> drug, and other. And if you look at this, you can see here, well, the colors are much nicer on the paper than they do. <laughs> um, you know, murders have been fairly consistent, a little bit of an increase in, in these years here, but you know, again, fairly consistent. The same with sex offenses. Where we see the biggest change over this time is with the violent offenses, which are our <coughs> Cal Green here, and our drug offenses. Drug offenses going down, violent offenses going up. So that's you know the composition we're seeing that trend over time of uh, what's going on there. Uh, there's a little bit of a change in weapons, but not much. It's, it's more of those two categories there. And again, the other and uh, property, you know, some change, but nothing drastic. But the violent and the drugs are your two crimes that are running, are, are moving things. Okay. okay, so what were the top crimes sentenced in 2016 in the district? The number one crime was assault with a dangerous weapon. Number two was attempted to commit robbery, robbery, armed robbery, and assault with significant bodily harm. So uh, assault with a dangerous weapon, a dangerous weapon can be a number of things. It can be a knife, it can be a gun, it can be a baseball bat. Uh, so that's when we call assault with a dangerous weapon. Some type of weapon was used. But you can see your robberies here, uh, again, attempt robbery and robbery very uh, close in numbers followed by armed robbery. Okay. And compliance rate. I mentioned to you earlier about the compliance rate. So I, I took the compliance rates from 2010 to 2016. You can see, uh, again, in the mid-80s in 2010, mm -hmm. that, 
last year was our highest, which was 96.7, but we also had very high compliance rate every year, 96, 94. So the, the court is following the guidelines. Okay, so the sentencing scenario. Now that you know all there is to my guidelines, and you can take my job, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about why someone can commit the same crime and get a different sentence. You know, that's very confusing to people. You know, two people, they both commit a robbery, and one person is out on the street in three days, and the other person goes away to prison for four, four years. And people say, I don't understand why they committed the same crime, why did they get different sentences? So you're gonna learn that tonight. Um, so we're gonna use robbery, since it's a crime that we see a lot of, and I want you to read the definition of robbery here. Robbery by force or violence, whether against resistance or by sudden or stealthy seizure or snatching or putting in fear, shall take from a person or immediate, or immediate actual possession of another, anything of value is guilty of robbery. That's a very wide definition. So that means that you can go anywhere from having a gun held to your back and give me your purse to pickpocketing, or what we commonly refer to as snatching. <coughs> So all of those fall under the head of robbery. So when you see the different types of sentences for robbery, you have to keep in mind that it does involve a wide array of behavior. Okay. So there's robbery on three levels on our grid. On level five is armed robbery here. And again, if you remember from our earlier lesson, it's all presumptive prison. So anybody that's an armed robbery should be getting presumptive prison. Robbery is on level six. And again, a large number of presumptive prison boxes, but you know, there is some short splits here. So that someone could do some time on short split. Now we get down to attempted robbery, and you can see there that you have to be pretty far over on the criminal history score before you're gonna get a presumptive prison sentence. You have the option for probation, you have the option for a short split, and you have the option for prison. So there's a variety of sentences that can be imposed for robbery, attempted robbery, and completed robbery. Okay. So scenario one, we have an, uh, an, an individual who's arrested for robbery, okay? They're indicted, and indicted means the prosecution has decided that there's enough evidence to have probable cause to bring these charges forward. Oftentimes at the time of the arrest, there's not enough, they don't have all the information, they get the information, they decide they're going to arrest him for robbery, they're going to indict him for armed robbery, and he's going to be convicted of armed robbery. And he's going to have a jury trial. And so that puts him, he has a criminal history of 1.75. So you can see here, armed robbery, criminal history, He's going to do 48 to 96 would be his range. The court imposes a 56-month prison sentence, doesn't suspend any of it, and it's a compliant sentence, and he's going to serve 4.6 years in prison for that robbery conviction, armed robbery. Okay, so let's go to another scenario. Scenario two here, he's arrested for armed robbery, he's indicted for armed robbery, but he's convicted of robbery. So this position comes as a result of a plea. So he's sentenced to 36 months because he's on the sixth robbery, but he has a criminal history of 1.5. So he's still gonna get a prison sentence, and it's gonna be 24 to 60 months, and he gets 36 months prison. So even though he had the option, he could have got a short split, his criminal history moved him from this box to this box, and so now he's presumptive prison. So it's not just the offense categories. That does give you a certain place on the grid. It's this criminal history that's going to move you, whether sometimes you get a prison or not, a non-prison sentence. So when you see your neighbor who doesn't get a prison sentence, and the other neighbor on the other side of you does get a prison sentence, and it's for the same offense, unless you know their criminal history, it's hard to understand whether why one gets one and one gets the other. Okay? Okay, scenario three. This, this individual gets arrested for robbery, he gets indicted for robbery, and he's convicted of robbery. And there's a plea. 
However, again, same <coughs> level that we had on the last scenario, only this person has no criminal history. So he is eligible for a short split sentence. So the uh, court imposes 28 months, which is the within the range there. They suspend 25. Remember, he has to serve six or less. He has three months to serve, followed by a period of probation. So he's going to do three months and then go on probation. Same behavior, same robbery, but the criminal history moves him from one to the other. Where one, he's eligible for a short split. The second person is not. Okay. And the final is he's arrested for rock, armed robbery. <coughs> he's indicted for robbery, but he's convicted of attempted robbery. <clears throat> and he has one criminal history point. So he may have done the armed robbery, but for whatever reason, um, he gets down to the attempted robbery. And because he only has one criminal history point, he's going to get, he's eligible for probation. So uh, that means he can uh, impose 12 months probation, I mean, impose 12 months, spend 12 months, and put him on 12 months probation. So again, what they're arrested for and what they end up down here for can change. But what the sentencing guidelines are is looking at this. What are they convicted of? And that's the sentence that's imposed. So just looking here, 2016, to give you a breakdown to see the number of cases we sentenced, we see here uh, attempt to commit robbery was the highest at 146, closely followed by robbery at 129, and then the armed robbery is the least frequently sentenced. Okay, and then looking at robbery sentences over the time, you can see here that uh, we had the attempted robbery seemed to, to spike, whoops, sorry, seemed to spike in 2012, and then there's been a decline on that. Uh, the robbery has been fairly stable. We see a jump here in, in 2015 and 2016. And then armed robbery, again, no distinct pattern. It seems like in 2014 it hit a high, but then it's been fairly stable. So there doesn't seem to be any really big trend with robbery, uh, except for the attempt robbery seem to be going down. Okay, the average sentence. And this is interesting, because I like numbers. Uh, remember we said that they were on five, six, and eight on the grid. They were on five, six, and eight of the grid. Okay. And the average sentence for attempted robbery is 16.8 months. And about, you double that, and you get the average sentence for robbery, which is about 35.4, I'm doubling it. You double that, and you get the sentence for um, armed robbery. So as the crime gets more severe, the sentence correspondingly also gets more convenient. And this is, again, just a breakdown of the types of sentences by the different levels. And again, because of the armed robbery, basically all probation. You see uh, the robbery. Remember, we have one short split box there. So you see basically prison, but there is some non-prison. And then you get down to the last one, which is attempted robbery. With the multiple sentencing options, you see about a third of prison, third short split, third probation. So it, it follows the grid as far as the types of sentences that are allowable under the grid. The actual sentences that are imposed follow that very closely. <clears throat> and finally, just to look at compliance, because if we're looking at robbery as a whole, you know, uh, very high compliance, 98.5% on the armed robbery, 0.7% on the attempted robbery, <coughs> Uh, the robberies where we see a little bit of a, uh, not a large amount, but there's some, um, some departures there. And basically most of them are downward when we see them on the robbery, they're going, they're going downward on that. So that is my uh, 101 sentencing guidelines. I'm sure all of you understand. Now they are simple. If you know, if you just understand how we think. Uh, and that, I think, you know, 
it, are they always perfect? Does everybody always get it right? You know, get the right sentence. If we knew who to, to give the rehabilitative options to, and who needs to be locked up for a long period of time, based on what we see, especially in those boxes where there's multiple options, uh, you know, it would be perfect. But uh, we do try to balance those two very carefully and focus on making sure that similar people are getting similar sentences. So, any questions? And thanks again to uh, Director Toos for such an informative and instructive presentation on sentencing guidelines. I believe you answered our questions and then more. Um, so we really appreciate it. So now we're going to transition. We've learned what the sentencing guidelines are. And now we're going to hear um, from some of our district's criminal justice leaders to understand how they apply the sentencing guidelines or how it affects their work in particular. Uh, so the panel is going to be moderated by um, Council Member Charles Allen. Uh, he's a Ward 6 Council Member as well as the Chair of the DC Council's Public Safety and Justice, uh, Judiciary and Public Safety Justice Committee. Um, and then I will um, also call for the other panelists and please feel free to come forward. Uh, we have Chief Judge Robert Morin of the District of Columbia Superior Court. Lorenzo Harris, Branch Chief Diagnostics uh, for CISOSA, Kimberly, Missouri, Assistant Chief, MPD, uh, Katya, and I'm so sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Um, <laughs> Special Counsel for Policy for Public Defender Service, Renata Cooper, Special Counsel to the U.S. Attorney, uh, Mina Malik, Deputy Attorney General, Office of the Attorney General, and we also have Barb Coombs, Sentencing Guidelines. Chairman. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Barbara, that was, it was simple. And so now we're ready to go. We've got it all figured out. Um, so that should make the panel discussion uh, go very smoothly. Um, I'll tell you what, we've got a really outstanding um, group on this panel. Um, first, I'll just say a little about what I do, what my job is. Then I'm going to actually ask each of our panels to just do a very brief introduction of just uh, yourself. And, um, and who you're with, and then I've got several questions to kind of get us started. So again, my name is Charles Allen. I am the Ward 6 Council member, but in January of this year, uh, I took over as the chair of the Council's Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. I like that you kept working justice into that too, because I think that's uh, appropriate. Um, I also want to point out Kate Mitchell, who's my committee director, is here as well, um, who I couldn't do anything without. So Kate's a huge part of my team, and I appreciate it. Um, but I know that I, I came into the role um, fairly cold, actually. I had not served on the committee previously, uh, so I have had uh, a wonderful group of partners from around the city that have helped me, I think, become a better chairman uh, right off the bat, and I really am grateful for everybody's <coughs> work on that, um, and, and have really learned a lot. Barbara, you know, it, it is simple and it's not, but you know, <coughs> folks like that, the presentation that you did, it really helped, um, helped me in my job but I think also help the community and help us all understand uh, the types of decisions, the work we're doing. So why don't I first just turn it over and we'll just go right down the line. Uh, I know you've already introduced yourself once, but I'm gonna make you do it again. Um, just to give a quick introduction of yourself and then I'll move to some questions. Okay. I'm Barb Tumasubi. I'm the Executive Director of the DC Sentencing Commission. Um, Chief Judge Robert Moore of DC Superior Court. I've been on the court for about a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to recognize uh, our longest serving judge in Superior Court, Judge Frederick Weisberg, who's also the chairman of the Sentencing Commission. So he's the person from my court who's in charge of making sure we all comply with the sentencing. So I look forward to our conversation. Good evening. I'm Kim Missouri. I'm an assistant chief with the Metropolitan Police Department. I'm here on behalf of uh, Assistant Chief Newsham. So uh, I'm glad to be here and thank you for having me. I look forward to this discussion. Good evening, I'm Renata Cooper and I'm an assistant U.S. attorney and I serve as a special counsel for policy and legislation for U.S. Attorney Lou. I also sit um, as her designee on the D.C. Sentencing Commission. Good evening, I'm Mina Malik. I'm Deputy Attorney General for the Office of the Attorney General representing Carl Racine. 
Good evening, I'm Lorenzo Harris, and I'm Chief of Investigations with CSOSA. Good evening, I'm Katerina Semyonova, I also go by Katya, and um, I'm a Special Counsel at the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. Our Director is Avis Buchanan, and I am Ms. Buchanan's designee to the Sentencing Commission. Right, well, thank you all very much. So as you can see, we've got um, leadership in basically every touch point uh, of, of the decision. Uh, that's on this panel. So seven people on a panel can sometimes be hard, but we're going to do it and we're going to be fine. Um, so what I'm going to do is maybe start with some questions that are broad, uh, kind of start laying the groundwork, and then I'll move into some more uh, specific and detailed questions. But so first, um, and really with the presentation that we just had, is a great foundation for this. Um, why don't I ask, and to just mix it up, I'll start with Katja this time and come down the table. Um, can you just speak very briefly about um, Given your agency's responsibilities and scope of work, how is the nature of what you do affected by the sentencing guidelines? So we meet clients for the first time at the time of their arrest, usually just after their arrest, and our mission is to provide those clients with the best possible representation. Uh, all the way through their cases, if they go to trial, if they go to sentencing, whatever happens down, down their path. And the sentencing guidelines um, really help us provide some measure of, of sort of predictability to what those individuals can expect going through. So it enables us to say, here's a possible, the likely, in fact, the highly likely outcome of a potential sentence if you lose a trial. Here's a highly likely sentence if um, you lose a trial on a lesser included offense. Here is the highly likely sentence if you accept this plea agreement with these charges. So it really helps us inform individuals at this critical point in their lives what they are facing under the various scenarios in front of them. Great, thank you. So Mr. Harris, how does it work for CSOSA? So uh, for CSOSA, we are at the very beginning stage. Uh, we conduct groundwork. So our investigators conduct uh, our diagnostic investigations, which, the, which are the pre-sentence reports. And so with the combination of uh, criminal history uh, and a social history, we uh, develop, uh, we pull up the criminal history score uh, that uh, Ms. Toomey talked about earlier. And so that's the front end. And then on the back end, of course, it affects us because uh, the people who are placed in supervision, we ultimately end up supervising. So unfortunately, the Office of the Attorney General does not have authority to prosecute felony offenses. <laughs> Congress gave the U.S. Attorney's Office exclusive jurisdiction to prosecute felony offenses in superior court. But having said that, we do have the authority to prosecute adults for certain misdemeanor offenses, and we also prosecute people under the age of 18 for all offenses that would be a felony if they had been committed by an adult. So the convictions for these offenses actually do have some impact on the criminal history under the sentencing guidelines if these individuals were, are, are rearrested within a specific time frame. And for any Office of the Attorney General criminal misdemeanor conviction with a penalty of 90 days or more of incarceration, there are a lot of a score of a quarter point, but any OAG misdemeanor with a penalty of less than 90 days incarceration is not scored. Again, for juvenile adjudications, offenses that would be for a misdemeanor, if they were an adult, are never going to be counted towards an adult's criminal history, regardless of when they were committed. But for offenses that would be a felony if they were on an adult, if the date of the disposition, regarding the date of the disposition or the date of release, is within five years of the commission of the instance of instant offense, that would be counted towards um, the uh, sentencing guidelines. And just of note, any adjudication beyond five years will not be counted or revived, and felony adjudications counted, are counted towards scoring an adult criminal history, but they are scored less than if they were adult convictions, and they are capped at 1.5 points. So the sentencing guidelines are not used when determining a sentence in one of our cases, whether it's an adult misdemeanor offense or a juvenile offense, but the convictions may affect the criminal history score of someone who was later sentenced for a felony offense under the sentencing guidelines. Well, thank you. So Ms. Cooper? 
Well, most of you know that our office is responsible for the prosecution of all federal crimes committed within the District of Columbia. And as Mina has already uh, alluded to, we are also uh, unique among the 93 offices of the U.S. Attorneys because we also have authority to prosecute local, all serious local crime that is committed by adults. And we also have authority for the prosecution of local crime that is committed by a small class of juveniles who commit a certain uh, type of offense or offenses. Uh, our, as ministers of justice, our overarching role and our overarching mission is to ensure the fair and impartial administration of justice in the District of Columbia with respect to our authority. Um, as such, you've asked how the uh, guidelines affect our mission. They don't affect it in that sense. We believe that they are part of how we achieve the mission. Uh, because we believe that the voluntary sentencing guidelines uh, bring about consistency and therefore fairness, um, that helps us to achieve our mission. Uh, we consider those guidelines even when uh, we are extending uh, plea offers to defendants. And of course, we consider those guidelines when we are um, getting prepared to allocute or make sentencing recommendations. Um, and I think the big takeaway there is that our office is required to uh, follow those guidelines. And Chief, how does it, how does it impact MPD? Uh, well, I think all judges are going to tell you. Okay. Okay. Sorry, oh, Chief. there's too many Chiefs here. <laughs> <laughs> That's how esteemed this panel is. It's been a long day. <laughs> we had a lot of Chiefs. I have lot of Chiefs. It's quite all right. The, um, I think MPD, uh, the, the sentencing guidelines are a little different with us. We clearly do not operate based on uh, sentencing guidelines. We don't make arrests <coughs> based on sentencing guidelines. Uh, but the guidelines can uh, definitely affect groups of individuals who we uh, will focus on, um, especially during our summer initiatives when we um, identify those persons of interest who we think uh, are, are possibly very likely to either commit crimes or possibly be victims of crimes. So um, when they have the guidelines for the repeat violent offenders, that is something um, that can possibly impact us in, uh, if we're seeing the same individuals that we are arresting uh, back out on the street and having to answer those questions uh, to the community who thinks that once we make an arrest, they're not going to see that individual anymore. And we know that's not necessarily the case, but sometimes the public doesn't understand it. So that's how um, forums such as this are very helpful. Now, Chief Judge, <laughs> you have probably the most, uh, most of all special relationships with the uh, sentencing guidelines. So how, how does it help affect? As I was anxious to tell you before, <laughs> uh, sensing is probably the most difficult thing a judge does of all the decisions we make. It's the thing that weighs the most heavily on us because we have the victims on the one hand in many cases, and then we have the defendant on the other. And prior to the guidelines, we had a very uh, wide range of sentences for what appears to be the same offense, similar offenders. And Judge Weisberg has early on educated us uh, about how helpful the guidelines are. So when we begin a sentence, it's it's important for us to know what the guidelines are because these are sort of historical averages of what people have received for the types of crimes that are before us. And so it is, I know we follow the guidelines. Uh, we make individual sentencing decisions and the guidelines are an important tool for us. Um, and I know it's an important tool for the attorneys who come before us. So it's, for us, it's a very informative tool. Uh, that gives us a range of what people have been sentenced for for similar offenses in the past, and it just gives us a starting point to consider an individual. And Barbara, anything you want to add from the body that helps review and establish any of this? Um, and no, I think you know one thing that we do pay attention to is when the guidelines are not followed. You know, uh, when we see departures, we, we like to know why those are occurring because maybe. It, indication to us that perhaps that <coughs> sentence or that offense needs to be re-ranked or it needs to be modified. So 
you know, that's why we monitor very closely because if we see a trend going on, then we want to make sure that we address it appropriately. Yeah. What's well, a perfect segue? Thank you. So, as you helped highlight for us, about 97% of all of uh, the decisions essentially are going to be within that sentencing guideline. So, there's not a wide degree of departure. Uh, but there will be at times be departure, and you talked about the um, aggravating and mitigating circumstances. Um, but even within the guidelines themselves, though, there is variability. And as Chief Judge said, in the past there was probably wider variability, but even within, I, I was noting as you went through your presentation, there was one that, um, I can't remember exactly where my row and my column was, but this piece that you had highlighted was a sentence of 30 to 72 months. And so just to break that down from months to years, that's two and a half years to six years. Um, so. There's variability there. Um, I'll, uh, Katja talked about kind of what it does for you and your clients of having the guidelines provi provide an element of predictability, an element of kind of stability almost, of this is likely what the outcome is going to be. Um, can I now ask you to talk a little about how you find the sentencing guidelines, the criminal history work, and then the process itself helps inform the variability within the guidelines, um, as well as when you see um, either a mitigating or aggravating uh, circumstance to depart. And maybe I'll start with the chief judge and work my way down the table. Okay. Chief judge. <laughs> okay. um, that's a very important point. And, and the way I think most judges think about it, as Barbara was saying, take robbery. There's a broad range of behavior involved in robbery. It could be pickpocketing. It could be someone punching somebody, getting them to the ground. And so I think the way most judges look at it is if we have a range, what type of robbery is this? And if, if, it, if it's a pickpocket, we'll be looking at the lower end of the range. If it's aggravated where the victim was severely hurt, okay, well that's a serious, very serious act. And so we, that's I think how we mostly use the range is we, and when judges, we often consult each other about sentences because we want, you know, we're not act, try not to act alone. And if I go to Judge Weisberg and I explain the sentencing, his first questions will be, "What's the guideline range?" And we talk about the range. Okay, where does this fit in that range? And it gives us a good calculus. That's be, that, you know. In addition, we hear the advocacy of the parties in front of us. So you may be persuaded. <laughs> that the individual in front of you is a changed individual or it was very serious impact on the victim and those types of things inform you as well. But that's, I think, barely how we use the range. We look at the type of conduct involved and is it sort of a mid-range offense or is it something more aggravated, less aggravated? Chief Missouri, um, to the officers in MPD, to what degree do you find that officers are aware of that range? And then does it or does it not impact uh, when they are investigating, uh, using the example of a robbery, um, and trying to take all the different facts at play to then lead towards uh, an arrest or a charge? Can, anything you share with that? Well, we're going to base our cases on what is provided and then ultimately probable cause for an arrest. So uh, again, I don't know that a lot of officers know what the sentencing guidelines are, to be honest. I mean, I listened to Director uh, Toom's uh, presentation today, um, and as law enforcement, um, sometimes we ask the same questions that are asked by the community. We make an arrest of someone who has committed a robbery, for example, and you know, a few weeks later that person is, we see them walking past us on the street, and again, we're getting the question, why did you release him or her? And having to try to explain exactly what the process is, I think that this is helpful, but I, I'm not going to say that it's the, the guidelines itself are going to impact what we do. We're going to base every case on evidence. So if we make an arrest, that person is eventually released, uh, you know, pending sentencing or pending their trial. If they reoffend and we have probable cause again to make an arrest, we're going to make an arrest. But again, it's not going to be based on the guidelines. So, uh, Ms. Cooper and Ms. Malik, then, so in, in your respective seats, um, how, how, do, how do you approach uh, that guideline and, again, looking at that variability that could be within the overall guideline? Well, again, um, consistent uh, with what the uh, chief here has said, 
um, it, the sentencing process is the culmination of a process after a verdict, uh, either by trial or by plea. And so the sentencing guidelines are not going to uh, impact the U.S. Attorney's Office's charging decisions um, at the point that they may, may be made upon arrest when they're presented to our office or after, those uh, after the evidence is presented to a grand jury that indicts. Those decisions are based on the evidence. Uh, we do, however, after we have that evidence, um, begin to consider the sentencing guidelines as early as our plea negotiations would start. And so at that point, we're considering um, in connection with whatever bargaining of the charge that we might be making, uh, where that would place that particular defendant uh, depending on the charge and on that person's particular criminal history, uh, where they would fall within those boxes, as, as uh, Barbara was explaining. Um, and we then negotiate based on those and consistent with those, um, even saying that we will perhaps agree to allocate or make a sentencing recommendation at the top of the sentencing at the bottom part of the applicable box, or that we uh, won't limit our recommendation to any part of the box and that sort of thing. So that's when they can begin to first come into our consideration and then certainly at the time of sentencing when we provide a lot of information uh, first to CISOSA as they are preparing a sentencing, uh, uh, a pre-sentence report and then during our actual allocution before the court. Thank you. So I think what's important to remember that are the, is the reasons, are the reasons for punishment, you know, one being deterrence, both specific deterrence as well as general deterrence, retribution, incapacitation and rehabilitation. So it's important to point out that over the past six years, judicial compliance with the sentencing guidelines has consistently exceeded 90% in recent years being at 90%, 95% or higher. And so if the guidelines were not meeting their goals, we would expect to see the judiciary departing from these voluntary guidelines. But I think the high rate of compliance here means that the guidelines have achieved their goals of consistency in terms of punishment, adequacy of punishment, and certainty of punishment. And I think it's important to remember that these guidelines are designed to balance fairness in sentencing, as well as the need to protect the safety of the community. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Harris, we, you we referenced just a minute ago, Ms. Cooper talked about CISOSA's role in helping with the, uh, the different reports and then the ongoing work after. Um, when you're looking at and, and examining a, a, a case, to what degree do, is CISOSA reviewing what could be either the internal variability within a, recommend, a, a guideline recommendation or uh, to the degree you take into consideration either aggravating or mitigating um, circumstances which either lead to a departure, although that sounds like that's fairly rare. It is. Uh, we uh, adhere to the guidelines uh, very strictly. At most, uh, what we do is we rely on our social history to inform the judges about whether or not uh, there are any mitigating circumstances or even aggravating circumstances. But in terms of CISOs themselves, uh, we don't uh, certainly don't uh, participate in any departures, and we don't make recommendations about departures. Ms. Sinova, anything you want to add? So I think one reason that departures, both for aggravators and for mitigators, are so rare is that 90% of the cases resolve in pleas, and a standard term in, a, in the plea agreement is that there can is that the defense cannot ask for a departure, and that the government cannot ask for a, uh, an upward departure. And so there, the the discretion is is cabin. I, I guess judicial discretion is not cabin in the sense, but what advocates ask for is cabin very much in. Um, within plea agreements, um, do not ask for anything outside of a particular um, of a particular guidelines box. Chief Judge, let me ask you a specific question for you. Um, as the judge, um, and obviously working with your colleagues as well, does the does the court you you reference other conversations you have with fellow judges? Is there a internal system by which? Um, either 
there, you know, the data is being collected, the, co the, uh, the decisions are being recorded in a way that you help compare each other. Um, you know, for example, as, as you've referenced, uh, robbery is so broad that, that you know, whether uh, I'm, I pickpocket versus I um, assault someone and, and rob, take their, their wallet. Um, how, how does the court and how do the judges be able to communicate with each other? Uh, is it just through conversation or is there a more formalized way that you're able to help compare with each other and, uh, and talk about that so that as we look to um, what seems to be a, a fairly consistent system within the sentencing guidelines overall, that there's also some degree of consistency within the court? That's a very important question. <clears throat> um, we have 26 judges in the criminal division. Uh, they meet every week for lunch. We have an uh, out-long meeting at lunch in which people discuss cases, discuss issues they're having. Um, it's a very important process for us to talk to one another uh, because there are ranges within uh, the guidelines. I have to say there are different sentencing philosophies among the judges. And I'm not sure that's a bad thing. That, that occurs. People have different views about sentencing. But the guidelines are important to us because it all keeps us within an expected range of the parties. And so some of our discussions, most of our discussions, where we're having difficulty on a sentencing is a discussion about whether we should depart from the guidelines. And so most judges, if they're going to depart from the guidelines, will counsel with other judges just to check themselves and say, okay, does this make sense to you? Otherwise, as you can see, um, Ms. Seminova was correct. We do, uh, the judges are prohibited by law from participating in plea bargaining. So the parties negotiate whatever the plea bargain is, and oftentimes the plea bargain comes to us and the parties have agreed that this will be a guideline sentence. And the judge will sentence within the guideline. So individual conversations is the way we do it most. Um, about three times a year, we have training among the judges where we're given hypothetical sentencing, and uh, people discuss what their sentence would be. So we start getting consistency just by talking about the factors. So we do that about three times a year, the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. Um, and we do challenging sentencing hypotheticals, real cases, and we discuss why judges would go with one sentence versus the other and start having common, common conversations about it. But there, is, there are different sentencing philosophies. There are, you know, judges come to the bench with different experiences. And, but the sentencing philosophies are restricted in a way by the guidelines. So that's why I think the guidelines are important. Thank you. I want to follow up, um, you know, Ms. Malik a minute ago talked about um, kind of the, the step back. So what's the goal here? You know, what, what's the goal of that sentence? You know, everything from uh, accountability and, and punishment to rehabilitation to uh, preventing reoffense, improving public safety. How, I, I'll direct this to Ms. Toombs, but uh, if anybody else wants to jump in. In what ways does <coughs> public safety um, or recidivism or reoffense is it evaluated? Is it measured in some way as we, as we seek to have a greater sense of certainty and predictability in the sentencing <coughs> guidelines? Is there any type of evaluation that comes back to see if um, the individuals who were sentenced through that or rehabilitated through their sentence um, are reoffending? And would, would that in any way impact the consideration of what the sentencing guidelines should or should not be? Well, I think you know, part of the criminal history plays a role in that. Because, you know, if they have been sentenced once and they serve their sentence and they come back and commit another crime, they commit the same crime, that is built in so that their sentence is going to be longer or more severe the second time than it is the first. And again, it, it depends on the nature of the crime. Uh, you know, violent crimes that are, you know, have more of a direct threat to public safety. So, uh, you know, there's less sentencing options for them where you have the lower, what I call the lower left-hand part of the grid, where we still believe that there's an option there that could be dealt, that person could be rehabilitated, dealt with appropriately in the community. And so it's sort of like, it's real easy to see the people on the, on the top left, top right-hand side, 
a very long history, very violent crimes. And then you have the people on the lower left have limited criminal history and um, you know, low level crimes. It's the ones in the middle that are always the most difficult in the middle part of the group because you know, they, the crimes are serious, maybe not as violent, but trying to figure out what is that appropriate sentence for them that will protect the public, keep them safe, but also allow them the opportunity to, you know, better themselves and not have that repeat criminal hit. So, you know, we're struggling all the time with that. Except when we rank, rank crime, that's one of the things we do is, you know, when a new offense is created, the commission will rank it. And that's the discussions we talk about, you know. Is this crime, does it belong on this level or that level? How does it fit in with other crimes of similar nature? You know, what does it fit? So it's just like uh, the judge has conversations about the sentencing. We have a, where do we rank this that it fits right? Okay. Uh, now we talked a lot about the 97, at least 95% compliance rate. So I'm curious, um, and maybe I'll start at the end and kind of work our way back so everyone has a chance to respond to this. Uh, what about that 5% where we go outside the guidelines? Is there anything that you see um, in cases that are outside of that uh, guideline that is a trend? Is there, is there anything that, um, that jumps out to you of how, how you evaluate if something is going outside of that guideline? Does it tell us anything about the sentencing guideline itself? Does it help inform, and that's why we'll end with Ms. Toombs, because she'll help close up this thread. Uh, does it help inform the sentencing guideline um, any revisions or changes that might be needed? Can you talk about what do you see as, um, as those 5% outliers? I see those outliers so rarely that um, I think the last that I can remember is um, a, a trial win where the judge sentenced outside of the guidelines for a firearm that was associated um, with the trial. Um, I, I see it incredibly rarely. So I don't know that there are any true trends that, that I can identify. Um, and frankly, that was so long ago that it may not even be rep it may not be representative in the data or of a, of a you know, correct recollection at this point. Yes, and that certainly is the case with supervision. Uh, you're aware we take everyone who comes through our door, so we don't quite look back to find out uh, whether or not there could have been an alternative to the sentence that was imposed. Uh, we are in communications uh, with the sentencing commission in the court to try to compare some data. Um, so we expect that that should be something that should be forthcoming soon. Okay. So in terms of juveniles and juvenile trends, you know, we're actually in the process of revamping our data collection um, with, in that respect. But we also recognize that a juvenile record can factor in when a youngster is or will be sentenced as an adult later on if he's he or she is convicted of a crime. I think what's important to remember is that each of these cases should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that's why these guidelines are voluntary because you are gonna have certain mitigating factors, right? Whether you depart from the guidelines and you go up or down, you are gonna have um, those, those mitigating factors. And I think just to piggyback on, on Ms. Toombs' point earlier, you know, it is important to remember that if you have somebody who's a repeat offender, right, if you have to figure out a way how to deter them from committing more serious, more dangerous, more violent crimes. And not, it's not necessarily appropriate, or I'm not advocating for three strikes, you're out. But if you have somebody who's committing violent crime after violent crime after violent crime, you have to figure out how to balance the community safety with the need, the need for fairness in terms of that particular defendant. And so I think it's important to, to note that, sure, someone can have a second chance and somebody can you know, have a lower sentence when they're convicted of one crime. But when you get up to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten violent crimes, something's gotta be done to protect the community, because clearly that person is a danger to society. I know how important nomenclature is to you, so I want to make sure um, that we are all speaking about the same thing. It's very important to note that there are things called departures, 
and there is this notion of non-compliance with the guidelines. Uh, departures are built into the voluntary sentencing guidelines, and as Barbara talked earlier about uh, the fact, she's spoken earlier about the fact that you can have upward departures or downward departures based on whether you either have um, aggravating or mitigating factors. So those departures can be made by judges and they can be recommended by the defense, um, downward departures usually, and by the government, uh, upward departures for aggravating circumstances as we see them. And a judge may um, accept and, and actually sentence in accordance therewith consistent with the guidelines. But if you are talking about what looks like a 3% rate of non-compliance with the guidelines when um, folks are not doing something that comes within the guidelines in any way, um, of course, we would all be interested in that and to take a look at when that happens. Is it for particular offenses um, or perhaps a particular uh, a defendant with a particular type of criminal history or, or other characteristics. Um, and that is exactly the type of, of work that the commission takes up um, to see what meaning, if any, there is in those, um, uh, in that non-compliance and to determine if there are any tweaks that need to be made to the guidelines. Gotcha, let's jump back in real fast. Just with it. We're not as excellent point about nomenclature. I, I am sure that, that I am thinking of instances of aggravators being applied consistent with the guidelines rather than straight non-compliance. So I, I too would be interested in hearing of non-compliance. Yep. Chief or Chief Judge? The two chiefs? I didn't want to start saying <laughs> Well, as far as trends, um, I guess one of the things that I've seen is uh, individuals who maybe start off with the, we'll call the misdemeanor offenses, for example, uh, breaking into cars. And then we kind of sometimes see that trend where now they're going from breaking into cars to actually still in the cars. And then we've seen the trend continue where they're not only still in the cars, but they're using the cars uh, to commit robberies or using it as a getaway vehicle, if you will, to commit robberies. Um, that's just an example of one of the trends that we see, but it was uh, very uh, well received by me to hear uh, Ms. Toon say that even those misdemeanor offenses that have happened in the past uh, can be considered if in fact there is a conviction for that robbery, even though it may be that person's first offense. Um, but again, we're answering the questions uh, in our community meetings when people want to know why is this person you know, back out? Why? You know, is he or she back walking down the street? What are you doing, you know, Mr. Officer, Ms. Officer, uh, to protect us? So, in kind of working with the esteemed members on this panel, um, I, I think I've learned something today, and uh, it will definitely be very helpful uh, when I go back and, and talk to our uh, personnel exactly how the process is working and what we can expect from sentencing guidelines and what we can learn from that, and that can kind of help us when we're talking to the community to share information. And maybe it's important for people to understand what happens and uh, if I as a judge sentence uh, non-compliant with the guidelines, I get in, within a week I get an email from the sentencing commissioner saying you didn't comply with the guidelines, please <coughs> it appears you did not Well, we do it a different way. So, and then can you explain, please explain to, explain to the commission why you didn't comply with the guidelines. Um, and so that's an effective way. I, I'd be interested in, from Barbara to see whether she has some sort of sense of that. I know I probably in 20, you know, since 2004, maybe have received two of those emails. And I looked back and, and realized one of the offenders was extremely young, in my opinion, and uh, had in my judgment, very good potential for rehabilitation, had done a lot of things, and I just thought I was, I thought there was enough of a future with this young man that I, I didn't think the guidelines should apply in that case because it, it was uh, prison only. Um, other than that, though, I mean, I, you know, you have to understand, we, 
we do 20,000 criminal cases a year. Okay, so that's 20,000 criminal cases a year. Uh, that's a lot of sentencing, and uh, I think I can speak on behalf of the bench. We believe in the guidelines, compliance with the guidelines. That's our intent. But you can't capture every hypothetical case, and we're presented with the individuals in front of us. So that's the only insight I can give. You. So kind of reframe that to Ms. Toombs then. So the, the three to five percent, um, from, as you review that, um, as the commission looks at that, that is that, um, are there trends within that that help inform your review? Is that kind of why perhaps you reach out to kind of ask for that, you know, why was this decision made? Or is the three to five percent, because again, 95 to 90 percent is a very high compliance rate. Um, is that more just, uh, that is the, judicial discretion that we want. We want to make sure that while we're providing these, uh, these types of frameworks and guidelines that are voluntary, you still want to leave the room uh, so that um, they get the voluntary. But you, you want to have that space as, um, as the judge, as, as Chief Judge outlined, where there's a unique case. Uh, you want to let the judge be able to have that discretion. Well, I think, you know, many times when we get the letters back, they will say, I chose not to apply the voluntary guidelines which is a legal sentence, and the court can do that. Uh, sometimes it's more... Mic just here. Speak, speak oh. into the mic just a little bit more. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, so, um, it's, you know, basically, when we see that happen, it's because they uh, have chosen not to use the guidelines in sentencing. And one of the things we see is, you know, they do not feel the sentence recommended by the guideline uh, would be, would be uh, how do they say it, an injustice to apply the supplied by the guidelines. So there's something about that case. And we respect that. Um, most of the time when we send the letters out, it's um, it's just they actually made a mistake and they'll correct it, you know, and send it back and say, I meant to do this, I you know, didn't uh, apply. So a lot of those letters come back if they are compliant sentences once the court recognizes that maybe they just didn't put something in the right box or something like that. I think, you know, um, I'm, I would be, so I would not want to have a system where it's 100% compliant because you need that amount of just uh, discretion from the judges to to be able to look at individual cases. You know, I think that we do get caught up in trying to fit everybody into a box sometimes. You know, you want consistency, you want certainty, but you don't want, you know, we're a criminal justice system, we're never going to have perfection. You know, we want to be able to look at individuals as individuals and hold them accountable, but also at the same time balance that with the need for that uh, that individual's uh, potential for change and for rehabilitation, because I don't think there's anybody in this room that can say sending someone away to prison is going to make them a better person. You know, they do not come out on a whole as a better person, so that should be our last resort where we've tried other options or they are an immediate threat to our society. And I think, you know, one time, I remember I was in grad school, my professor saying to me about sentencing, you know, we have to separate out who we're mad at and who we're afraid of. And oftentimes, it's the people we're mad at, it's that repeat offender who just keeps doing it over and again, you know, and or which is different than that person who is, you know, a threat to your life. And sometimes we get those two mixed up. And I think it's, you know, what the guidelines is trying to do is to try to make that differentiation. That's a great point. Um, so to the audience, I'm going to turn to the audience just a little bit uh, to see if there are any questions. So you can put your thinking caps on. I'm going to ask one more question, but as a warning, I'm coming to you next. Um, and then if, since we don't have a mic in the audience, I don't think I will. Um, oh, we do. Never mind. We do have a mic in the audience. I was going to say I'll repeat everything. All right. So let me ask this. Um, the U.S. has about 5% of the world's population. We have about 25% of the prisoners in the world. <coughs> As I'm hearing a lot of the discussion, part of the sentencing guidelines helps us um, create some rationality, some predictability, some degree of certainty. Um, and I, it feels like I'm hearing in many cases sometimes it also is allowing for, um, for that discretion that looks for that downward departure. So to what degree do, we, do you see, if at all, um, sentencing guidelines as part of the way in which we work um, to try to stem the tide of the mass incarceration that, that we have within 
the U.S. Is, is that a factor? Is it not a factor? Um, just kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. And I'll put you to right on the spot, Barbara, and start that. I think the guidelines are trying to put the right people in prison for the right amount of time. And that's how, I think that's very basic, but that's what we're trying to do is so that, you know, there is a public safety. I mean, I want to be able to walk out of my door and not worry about being robbed or mugged. But again, you know, make that determination, who needs to go to prison and how long do they need to be there? And I think what we got caught up with, you know, sometimes is everybody goes to prison. And so I think the guidelines are good for the district in separating that out and making some really sound decisions. Okay. Chief Judge? I, I think the guidelines are very important. I, I will say personally, um, you know, there is a concern that they're self-reinforcing. So we have 95% guideline compliance or more. So the range of the sentences are going to be um, where they are. And um, I know the difficult work of the commission very difficult work and everybody's at the table um, but every now and then maybe we should re-examine um, these ranges I think they are historical ranges um, but I, that's the work of the Commission I mean they're very smart people on the Commission very thoughtful people um, but at this point since we're not departing from them these are going to be the sentences so if they end up with uh, more incarceration than you as a legislature think is appropriate, um, that's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> Chief, is there any thoughts? I, we, we are definitely in favor of rehabilitation. Um, it's, it's, it's not that we want to go out every day and, and make arrests, but we are encountering situations where we uh, have to make arrests. So, um, again, even though we don't abide by the sentencing guidelines, when we know that there's someone who um, has been through the system and maybe they're uh, on probation or parole and they have some type of guidelines that they have to adhere to and they do not adhere to those, once again, <coughs> who tends to sometimes be in front and center, we will get contacted. And now we have to go back to this person and then if it's some type of court order condition that they're not abiding by, which is supposed to help rehabilitate them, and they're not abiding by it, then we can, in some instances, go out and make arrests. So we, uh, I'm not personally in favor of mass incarceration. I am in favor of uh, rehabilitation, and um, this information that I've received this evening has definitely um, opened my eyes to a lot of new information. Thank you. Ms. Cooper. Our office uh, continues, as, as we long have been, to be focused on public safety and uh, focused on the prosecution of violent crime um, in the city, as is the department as a whole. Uh, we believe that the voluntary sentencing guidelines in the district, um, rightfully, are advisory in their nature um, and do provide not only the certainty that the indeterminate sort of 5 to 10, 15 to 20 style uh, of system did not provide, but also appropriately uh, provide for a, a bit of latitude for judges, including non-prison boxes. Um, we believe that's appropriate, and um, that allows for, uh, based on our recommendations, for judges to do what they think uh, is appropriate, and um, that can, in and of itself, deal with issues of prison population. Ms. Bell? So you raise a very important point, Council Member Allen, in terms of mass incarceration and how the sentencing guidelines influence and stem the tide of mass incarceration. I have to say, you know, as a prosecutor in New York, um, one of the things we really looked at was not only the deterrence and incapacitation, but also rehabilitation, right? And so the sentencing guidelines where they allow for probation with some sort of program, I think might stem the tide of mass incarceration as opposed to you know, locking people up for X number of years. But I think what's important to note also is that there is a lack of certain programs, and this is across the country, that can stem that, mass, that tide of mass incarceration while rehabilitating offenders and making sure that they don't re-enter the criminal justice system. So I think it's important to recognize that the sentencing guidelines do 
have that effect when you can sentence someone to probation or do a split sentence or do probation with a program, but you have to take into, into account that maybe we need to improve the, the services and the programs that are out there so that we can help people truly rehabilitate. So uh, we appreciate the fact that the uh, commission um, regularly reviews the guidelines and we're confident that they will make adjustments based on the appropriate research uh, to address mass incarceration. Thank you. Ms. Aminova? I'm an absolutely new member to the commission. So my experience looking at this grid goes back to 2006, um, 2007, trying felony cases and advising felony clients. I don't remember anything changing in terms of the numbers on this grid in all those years. Maybe they have changed. Um, I don't have a historical index here. Ms. Um, Tomes, Tomes Kumi can tell us. Um, but I think the question is, do we really need that much incarceration for each of these boxes going down? What is the evidence that a year could not be removed from each of these sentences and still provide sufficient um, rehabilitation, uh, a period of community safety through incarceration, other programming, retribution. So that question can be, should be posed to the commission about whether these, these offenses could be reduced. Um, another question that could be posed is how these interact with mandatory minimums that are imposed by the legislature. And in many of these boxes, the bottom is really much higher because of a mandatory minimum that, that applies. And so should those mandatory minimums continue to apply and what is the effect of sort of raising the level of mass incarceration when you have thoughtfully, um, thoughtfully made guidelines where the bottom is constantly lifted by mandatory minimums? Let me let Ms. Toombs uh, respond but quickly because I'm gonna to turn to the audience to see if we can get through right. a few questions uh, here. Those are good points. Uh, the guidelines have been in place for since 2006, so this this year, last year was 2016, 10 years. The commission, you know, on its own accord, went and undertook a evaluation study of the guidelines to see were they working as we intended them to work. I actually reduced, uh, released a report in March of this year that lists out several different recommendations for the commission to look at over the next couple of years as far as ways the guidelines could be improved. And so, um, you know, we will be looking at criminal history where we will be meeting with uh, individual groups to hear their personal experiences. There's some issues with the way sex offenses are sentenced. And so, you know, proactively we are addressing those and one of the things that we will look at is whether additional boxes need to be or additional severity level needs to be up Okay, great. I want to turn to the audience. I will ask, uh, since we, we don't have a whole lot of time, let's make sure our questions hopefully are brief. And to our panelists, we'll try to keep our answers brief as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, the one thing I haven't heard mentioned is you're mentioning incarceration. But I know from having been to five DC JAM meetings that they're including trauma in this childhood trauma, growing up in this city in the violent environment and all of that. So my question is, okay, so you have to incarcerate a person for a certain time. So what goes on, you're just putting them in a cell or can you mandate with your um, commission what goes on when they're incarcerated? Are they getting mental health services? Are they getting educational opportunities? I mean, just sitting in a jail cell for, I mean, they need to be doing something with their minds. And is that being included in this? And also, the thing I haven't heard mentioned was the impact statements. So let me, let me make sure I give them a chance to respond. Because we're going to run out of time. Mr. Harris, start, you want to jump in? So that begins with the uh, pre sentence investigation. So with the social history that uh, we pull together, one of the things we do as well is assessments to make determinations about behavioral health, mental health needs, education, employment. And we do make recommendations uh, for uh, the Bureau of Prisons as well as um, for when the person is coming out of uh, prison or if they're being released to the community about what social services that they can need. I have a question. 
Um, my question is uh, two. One first question is, what percentage of that number when you classify on the, uh, the master grid has to do with trauma? And also, does your data break down into uh, ethnic demographics across the same crime? Is that maybe a question to the sentencing commission? One, one's for CSOSA and okay. one's for the commission. So what percentage of the number do you classify their background and mitigating circumstances? What percentage of that number? And also uh, the second question is for them. So uh, in terms of trauma, we don't quantify trauma. <coughs> And we also don't incorporate it into the guidelines. So, so that's something that we do explore. And we certainly train our supervision officers uh, to keep an eye out for that and to, when to recognize it, and also to include it in our reports. But it isn't something that we include into uh, the criminal history score or the uh, sentence, the uh, ultimate sentence. That's strictly based on the, the, what uh, Ms. Toombs mentioned earlier the instant offense and the criminal history. Ms. Toombs, do you want to add to that? Oh, again, the sentencing decision is primarily in those two variables, but, you know, again, the judge's <coughs> discretion to look at the different types of things and, and putting that sentence within the range is important. We do not have data on trauma. We have basic demographic data, but not trauma data. So my question was, do you break down the data over ethnic demographics? Uh, you mean, so you, what you're asking is, are sentences broken down by race? Yes. 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 Um, I will, well, I guess I have a follow-up question to that. Um, I think most people in the room are aware of the, the demographics in the city versus the demographics of those who are incarcerated, where we have, um, African-Americans making up less than 50% of the DC population, but making up around 95% of the incarcerated population. Given that the guidelines are based, are historical, right? Based on historical averages and also based on criminal histories that um, research has shown that, you know, based on prior arrests and convictions, um, that there has been and continues to be racial bias um, that informs that history, which then in turn informs the guidelines that we're using now. How are you know, the prosecution, uh, both members of the court, especially and judges, um, and the Sentencing Commission taking that into account? Are we evaluating the guidelines to account for that racial bias that continues and persists in the district um, criminal justice system? Yes, that uh, criminal history, when you're speaking about the, <coughs> the bias in criminal history, we are actually going to undertake a whole day-long retreat here in November to look at criminal history and how it's calculated and to, to determine whether there are any uh, unintentional or disparities that are occurring uh, in sentencing as a result of that criminal history. So that is something, like I said, we've already uh, planned for a day-long retreat for the commission to address that. Uh, topic because we are aware of it. Anybody else wanted to add to that? All right, well, that's going to be our last question. Our time is up, so thank you all very much. Um, would you all please help join me in giving our panel a round of applause? Thank you all very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Vanessa Butler to help close this out. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Morales and panel. This was really an enriching um, uh, opportunity, an opportunity for us to really to, to learn more about sentencing guidelines in the District of Columbia. I'm hoping that you um, share the sentiments that I have that um, we want to make sure that uh, our community is educated about how the system works. The system is nuanced and it, it can't be complicated, notwithstanding um, uh, Barb's note that sentencing guidelines are easy and they're pretty straightforward. Um, I would implore you, we actually have been taping this, so we want to make sure that we're able to also get the presentation out um, because we know that we don't have the benefit of everyone here this evening. We want to make sure that um, our community is informed and better educated about how our system works. 
these public meetings provide us with such an opportunity. Um, your feedback, your comments are essential for us as an agency. So you received comment cards. We welcome your feedback on uh, what you learned today and also your thoughts and your recommendations on other uh, topics for, for future public meetings. So please take a few moments to provide us with that feedback. Once again, I want to thank our panelists. Barb, again, thank you for the overview and thank you for participating in our fall public meeting. Have a great and safe evening.